I will walk deeper into the belly of the beast if it means I'm able to further limit reckless government spending. I mean, I have so many ideas. Some are simple, like take down traffic lights and eliminate the post office. The bigger ones will be tougher, like bring all of this crumbling to the ground. Broadcasting from Brisbane, Australia, this is The FOMO Show. I'm Matt. And I'm Joe. And this is a podcast where you hear about blockchain, cryptocurrency, emerging markets, and future tech in relatively plain English. We'll help you stay across what's going on so you don't get the fear of missing out. You can find us at FOMO.show or by searching for The FOMO Show on your platform of choice. Everything in the show is in the show notes. You can find links to the stuff we're talking about and timestamps to the, to the relevant parts so you can always skip ahead or find it later. So this episode, we'll be talking about collectibles and provably rare smart assets. Mm. So that's going to be our feature this week mm. and it's a really interesting topic. Um, really enjoyed digging more and more into that as we went. Yeah, that's it's super exciting. I mean, we've seen a couple of videos on it. We're also going to be talking about Malwarebytes in our uh, privacy and security section. It's security software for your Windows PC or Android phone Mm. or iOS device. Yeah, yeah. And look, it's something you really need to be thinking about if you're on a platform that's susceptible to malware. Mm. So, yeah, we'll we'll highlight that. Mm. And uh, we're also going to go through a fair bit of news. There's some really interesting things that have Mm. happened in the last couple of weeks. It was a really difficult decision to actually decide what not to report in the news this week. So... Yeah, so we're gonna we'll talk about the news, but we'll probably discuss the the, the broader topics that that come with all of those new news items a little bit more this week as well, just because there's so much mm. really interesting stuff. Mm. So let's get into it. Yeah, what have you been up to recently? We had the blockchain for business meetup yeah, last week here in yeah, Brisbane. We did um, practical smart contracts. You were live coding a smart contract. Yeah, I was like, you were building a better Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it it. it Things had changed since I'd last done it on the. Oh, yeah. So you do it on like a, the emulatory a, thing, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's like yeah. a web-based emulator, and things had changed a little bit. And I think I just hadn't gone back through my material enough. I think I'd changed my contract, but I hadn't updated my copy of the contract somewhere. So right. anyway, we we muddled through, and we eventually got to something that could kick Kickstarter out of the game and give investors a lot more surety about. The fact that they're not just going to run off and buy Lambos. Yeah, it was um, really interesting to see actually because mm. not only the smart contract emulator that you were using, so you're actually just coding the smart contract and it basically like runs it in a virtual sort of environment. So you sort of pretend and then you tried to sort of break it and you create a few different accounts and because you were making a clone of Kickstarter, it was really interesting to see trying to hack your smart contract and find the flaws and for me, because I've never seen a smart contract being coded before, really interesting. Mm. So, yeah, thanks for doing that, man. And uh be interesting to see sort of more about that as time goes on. But, yeah, mate, you should live Twitch streams. <laughs> yeah, I'll need to brush up a bit more. There's actually a couple of interesting bits of news we'll talk about later that are really getting like getting me keen to jump back into that because I haven't done a lot of it recently. Um, so, yeah, I, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Mm, um, and you're not a developer by trade, are you? No, 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 so no, no. So, you're no. not a developer and you're coding smart contracts? Yeah, you're trying to. Like, mm. I mean, they're still very rudimentary smart contracts and I've still got a lot to learn. Um, but it's really good fun, man. Like, mm. it's really... Uh, what I love about it is that you get to actually use the a blockchain in practice and you can mm. show people because I talk a lot to, to a lot of people about blockchain smart contracts I do workshops and all sorts of things but not in many of those workshops do I actually get down into the nuts and bolts and mm. say this is how you actually do it and it's it's tough because that's my favorite part like that's the part where a lot of people and I could see it like I can see it watching people once they get it the, the light bulb comes on and they're like oh wow I can see how this would be really different Mm. because you've got the money right there it's sitting there in the contract and you're interacting with it directly and and it's completely auditable you can set um you set the rules and it just behaves like the rules and there's obviously people that are a lot more proficient at it than i am but it's 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 really cool i i love it like watching 
and and that people were really engaged. People too. were leaning forward in their seats. I was sitting at the back, so I saw <laughs> people were leaning forward out of their seats, taking notes. It was incredible. Yeah, I enjoyed that. that yeah. Really yeah, yeah. So that was really good. Um, yeah, I can't think of too much else I've been up to. But what have you been up to? Mate, I've been, well, busy working, but also um, we've been in touch with um, TM from CoinGecko, um, mm. who, which is a really cool cryptocurrency stats website. They measure every, well, a bunch of different cryptocurrencies by a few different metrics. They give you a percentage for how active the developers are, a percentage number for how active the community is and how much chatter there is around it and it's a really interesting way of being able to gauge some of these cryptocurrencies so we're hoping to get him uh, in a recording later this month but um mm. i need to actually get back to his email because i'm a terrible communicator <laughs> so shout out to tm yeah quick disclosure this is not investment advice yeah, so new cryptocurrencies seem to be popping up every day. It's hard to know which ones are legitimate, which ones are not. We're not saying you should buy anything at all. This is an investment, legal, financial, or any other type of advice. Mm. We're po- both personally invested in different cryptocurrencies, some of which we talk about on the show. But if we talk about a project, it doesn't mean you should buy it. So do your research, never invest more than you can afford to lose, and most importantly, avoid the fear of missing out. Mm. If you're new around here and new to crypto, check out our Blockchain Basics series. It starts at episode two and continues till episode eight. It'll give you some grounding in the fundamentals and help you understand what on earth we're talking about. Which would be good for us to be clued in on as well. Mm. (laughs) I'd say, so what's been going on in the news, mate? Yeah, so first bit of news, Gemini has launched the Gemini dollar, which is essentially US dollars on the blockchain. Gemini is a cryptocurrency exchange run by Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss. And if you've been watching any kind of crypto news, you'll see these guys pop up all the time. There are very early Bitcoin investors, made a lot of money from it. And they've uh, launched the Gemini dollar, which is a one-to-one US dollar backed stable coin. From their announcement post, they said that you'll be able to convert US dollars in your Gemini account into Gemini dollars and withdraw them to an Ethereum address that you specify. So you'll also be able to automatically convert dollars into uh, Gemini dollars into US dollars by just depositing them into your Gemini account. So the US dollars um, will that correspond to those dollars um, so will be held at a bank located in the United States. And in addition, the US dollar deposit balance will be examined monthly by an independent registered public accounting firm to verify that there is a one-to-one peg. Furthermore, they said, the smart contracts underlying the, do- the Gemini dollar have been fully audited and formally verified by an independent security firm whose report is publicly available. Really interesting. Yeah, look, this is actually massive. And I was um, actually, it was last week at the Blockchain for Business event where we were talking about smart contracts and someone asked the question, well, how do we do this in in practice? You know, And I said, well, the biggest hurdle is that you have to convince people to put their funds in Ethereum. If you're talking about a public network, you've essentially got to, if you want to do like big scale smart contracts for traditional, to replace traditional contracting arrangements, you need to trust that Ethereum is going to be a safe place for you to put the money. And uh, and what we've been lacking is a really well done stable coin, which has a presence on a big network like Ethereum. And so this is the this is the solution right here. What they're saying is we're going to have a stable coin on the network, which is pegged to the US dollar. It's all audited, verified, and you're going to be able to build smart contracts, which don't denominate in Ethereum. They'll be on Ethereum, but they'll be denominated in US dollars which means that when you make a contract and you say on X date, someone's going to pay 400,000 US dollars into a different account, the smart contract's going to do that, it'll do it in US dollars. Mm. Instead of having to wait, let's say it's a 60-day contract, if you put that into Ethereum, over 60 days, you could lose half your value Mm. Mm. or it could be double the value or whatever. It's very volatile. People are comfortable transacting in US dollars because the volatility is a lot lower and they'll happily accept that volatility because it's US dollars. So it's a huge deal. It's a huge deal because we can finally start talking about having enterprise level smart contracts 
uh, which target traditional markets. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's awesome. It's like another. It's it's another step. These stable coins are another step towards yeah bridging those two worlds. As you're saying, it's really interesting from the Gemini. Um, White paper, the Gemini dollar white paper, um, the intro says that they actually highlighted some of the real failings of the traditional stable coins. They said several implementations of fiat pegged stable coins have been proposed, but they all lack some combination of supervision, transparency, and examination. And in their white paper, they actually delve into how they're actually making sure it's supervised. So it's semi autonomous, but there's actually some oversight. So you can actually make sort of make sure that. This is all happening according to plan. Yeah. Well, like what people have alleged with Tether. You know, Tether is like one of the the ones that people have said, well, it hasn't been audited. How do we know that it's actually backed by the amount of US dollars it says? And there's people, even as recently as like a week ago, saying Tether's just going to all come crumbling down and um, there's going to be a lot of, lot of issues because of it. Um, so... These guys are going the right way, and uh, and look, I actually got really excited for a similar reason because there's an Australian company who are trying to do yeah. something very similar, and uh, they're called OnRamp, and we'll link them in the show notes as well. Um, and uh, they are trying to do this. Well, they're actually doing this for an Australian dollar. They, they're actually doing this for the Australian dollar, and they're going to have an Ethereum token which will be a stable coin pegged to the Australian dollar, which means that I can now start talking to enterprise clients about implementing smart contract solutions, which are pegged to the Australian dollar. That's really cool. Which is amazing. Like we've needed something this, something like this for a long time and it's finally starting to happen, which is really exciting. So next bit of news, a dormant Bitcoin wallet holding $720 million has woken up. And the owner is a mystery. Um, so this came out of CCN and it said, yeah, a $720 million sleeping giant has woken up after four years with a $100 million move to Bitfinex and Binance over the course of 10 days. The Bitcoin wallet contains 111,114 Bitcoin or 0.52% of the total supply. Wow. So the original wallet owned 111,000 Bitcoin which is currently valued around $844 million. So that's in Bitcoin and the Bitcoin Cash forks mm. without taking into account other Bitcoin forks. Mm. Just an insane amount of money. So apparently that was like around, I think it was 70 grand that would have cost them at the time or something like that. But That's pretty good for, for 70 grand, 70 grand investment. It would have been better if they just put it in government bonds. Well, Bitcoin's just pretend money anyways, and it's just fake. Yeah. <laughs> Next. So next bit of news, the Bank of America charges clients 6,000 times more in fees than the Bitcoin network does. So how did that, how does that work in, in practice? So let's say you're wanting to transfer $90,000, mm-hmm. okay? Um, so transfer $90,000, it would cost you $45 with a bank or $0.75 cents with the Bitcoin network. Interesting. Which is quite a lot more. And the Bank of America, along with other domestic US institutions, makes use of the Federal Reserve's money transfer network, Fedwire, which charges them a maximum 83% to process a payment. According to its public figures, however, the Bank of America charges customers themselves up to $45 for the same service. So they're just char- they're making $44. It's 83 cents it costs them. Wow. So it's... Yeah, you that's money. Not bad. That's unreal. They're marking that up significantly. Ooh. And that's not even... I mean, I guess that's that's just a domestic transfer, isn't it? Um, but if you... Well, actually, no, that's just your fee, isn't it? But if you want to transfer, say, internationally, and you've got to use the SWIFT network... Good luck to you. You're looking at a lot more. Mm. Small bit of news. Fidelity Investments are set to release crypto products over the next few months. So Fidelity Investments is this massive company. They run run a bunch of funds and do a bunch of different financial services. They have $2.45 trillion in assets under management. So they make a little bit of money in fees. Um, So they're a pretty small player in the game, really. But um, yeah, speaking on... The other Friday at a Boston FinTech Week conference, uh, their CEO didn't go into specifics, but basically keep an eye on Fidelity because they've got a pretty good reputation in, um, as crypto positive. So it'll be interesting to see what sort of things that they look at. 
It's more institutional adoption, mate. Yeah, next bit you've been pretty excited about. Yeah, so Walmart, uh, just this last week, has bought 17,000 Oculus Go VR headsets to train a million employees. Wow. So that's four per super center, which I guess is their big shops, and two per neighborhood market and discount store. Yeah, and they've said that it will get used primarily to brief associates on new technology, compliance, and soft skills including empathy and customer service. Mm. So empathy is something that you need to learn, Mm. apparently. Mm. It's trainable. Mm. Mm. So prior to full-scale deployment, Walmart and Striver, which is a company that's helping pilot this technology, did a 10-store pilot of the VR training software. And uh, that associates were able to see and practice loading the pickup tower, a new online order pickup option before it was even physically installed. Which so they, is super cool. Yeah, yeah. So they essentially said, look, we haven't installed this thing yet, but when it's installed, we want you guys to be able to use it. So what we're going to do, we're going to make a game, essentially. We're going to program it into like a virtual environment and we're going to get you to interact with it before this thing ro- lo- rolls out. So we know that once it's in store, you're all going to be entirely proficient at using it. And it's a really good idea because think of the amount of times that you've gone to a store and someone's like, oh, yeah, we, this is a new system. I don't really know how to use it. And then you spend five minutes standing there at the counter waiting for them to put your transaction through. So it'll circumvent a lot of that. Yeah, at that's least. a very good point. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. So they expect that um, these lessons will reach those on the floor who interact with customers the most, um, which is pretty important because historically there have been some sort of pickles when it comes to customer client interaction there. But their senior director of uh, academies said that we've also seen that VR training boosts confidence and retention while improving test scores 10 to 15%. So I think it's just making things practical and VR is just a great way of making things practical. It's happening in your brain. You're getting engaged. Yep. It's just a great training mechanism. Yeah, and especially for like the younger employees that are coming in, I think it makes so much more sense to get them on this kind of s- software because for the first thing, they get to do something cool, which is put on a VR headset and like interact with things in VR. So you've already got them engaged because they're like, this is awesome. Mm. I get to like actually do VR now at my workplace. It's great. The best way to be underpaid. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, yeah, they get to like actually tailor the experience so they can control the training environment very well. They don't have to worry about how these people are going to get trained on the floor, like whether the individual trainers are good enough. They just build a killer uh, VR training program and just run that for everyone, you know, and you can code in all the competencies. You can code in, you know, if someone does the wrong thing, the VR will be able to pick up, the game will be able to pick up, well, okay, yeah, they've done the wrong thing. And so it just makes a lot of sense. And it's this, it's a real trend we're seeing, and we've been tracking it for a while, haven't we, where, where VR is getting more and more adoption in these big enterprise settings because they're finding that it's a great way to cus- cut costs mm-hmm. and increase productivity. So, interestingly, worldwide, um, Walmart hire over 2.3 million people. So, training is not cheap. Yeah. And, I mean, you look at Amazon. Amazon have over half a million employees. So, you don't really see any faces of Amazon, but there are people running around warehouses whenever you're you know, clicking and cl- clicking and ordering. Mm. Um, Home Depot uh, hire 400,000 people in the US. So, like, these are big employers and VR can save them a lot of money. Yeah, so it's, it's something that we'll continue to watch. Um, and, mate, I'm just loving seeing all these companies, the way that they're uh, using VR and the different ways they come up with to use it. Because, I mean, I'm still talking about that real estate company that was using oh, VR. Like, that was awesome. Man. Oh, if uh, if you didn't catch the episode, in episode 23, we talked about a real estate company who was using VR to essentially do away with all their real offices and have a whole bunch of virtual offices, which essentially let them conduct a nationwide business without having to have any office space at all. And so, the, all their internal staffing, uh, staff interactions and meetings and even like their conferences, I think, was all held in VR. It's insane. Like you, you just being able to bring everyone together into the same place, like mm. that, it looks awesome. And we're seeing just a little snippet 
of what's going to happen more and more. Because yeah. there are stats from, I think it was Gartner, I'm p- plucking these stats out of midair, but it was like by 2050, basically no one's going into work. Like yeah. People are working from home. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it, it's because it's so much better. Mm. I mean, I'm doing it already a bit myself now. I'm working from home and, uh, and increasingly I'm working more and more from home. And it is, it's the best because it, I, I can get up and my office is literally right next to my bedroom. Mm. So, my commute is five steps down the hallway. Saves fuel. Saves fuel, saves time. Mm-hmm. I'd probably lose two hours a day at least commuting at the moment. Do you get angry in traffic? Yes. Mm. So, mental health you might suggest is slightly improved? Slightly improved, yep. I get more time to do other things. Nice. Um, I get to see the sun. Cool. Like literally, the sun comes through my office window in the morning now, which is just sunglasses at really, work. It's great. I mean, and so it's, yes, but mental health—that is—that's a big thing, man. Like, and the fact that you can do it in your own environment, you choose where you want to work. I'm shocked that employers aren't clamouring to put more and more of their employees on remote working arrangements. It's, in some ways, you can see like there is a real control element where people are like, oh, if they're not at the office, I can't control seeing what they're doing and peering yep. over their shoulders and but as long as you've got deliverables that's check, right and check is it being done yes no okay yeah yeah and as long as you're incentivizing people to do the work and they'll generally be more thankful for the ability to work remotely um i'll take a pay cut to work from home oh mate well you because your expenses will be down the technology they're going to do that will probably explore down the line, but I mean, they're already here. Um, yeah. The company that I look at marketing for, we, we do that. We set up companies with you know, VPN, so you can just VPN into your company securely. Yeah. Um, you can access all the stuff you'd access at work. Yeah. You know, just using these like, you know, um, VoIP calling things, and you can just call people from anywhere. Yeah. So it just means the office can be anywhere. It doesn't matter. The future is here. Mm. Next up. SpaceX will send a Japanese billionaire artist to the moon and it'll be live streamed in VR. Yeah, so this was uh, news out of The Verge, but it's, it's been all over the place. And the, the, uh, the main kicker for this was Elon Musk's tweet. And he said in his tweet, the moon mission will be live streamed in high def VR so it'll feel like you're there in real time, minus a few seconds for the speed of light. It's insane. Yeah, and when's this? It's scheduled for 2023, is it? Is indeed. So it's the billionaire founder of Zozo Town, which is Japan's largest online clothing retailer, Yusaku uh, Maezawa. Absolutely bastardized in his name. I'm sorry. Yeah. So he'll be the first private customer. Yeah. Taking a few artists with him to turn the entire r- ride into an art project called Dear Moon. Dear Moon. Mm. Dear Moon. Why are you so bright? Why have you not accepted Doge yet? Why have you not added me on Facebook? Please retweet my tweet. Dear Moon. Sincerely. The Fellow Show. Next bit of news. The World Economic Forum has said that machines will do more tasks than humans by 2025. So, right now, apparently 29% of workplace tasks are done by machines. But by 2025, it'll be more than half. When they say machines, are they talking about computers I have a feeling, yes. So, yeah. like spreadsheets and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but, right, so that's moving from 30% today to over 50% by 2025. That's them projecting forward. So, they put together a report, The Future of Jobs 2018, which I'm sure we'll read at some point or not. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it sees robots swiftly replacing humans in the accounting, client management, industrial, postal, and secretarial sectors. Um, And jobs that require human skills, such as sales, marketing, customer service, should see demand increase, meanwhile, uh, along with e-commerce and social media. Interesting that they're saying client management would be done by robots. Now, that is an integral part of some businesses, but maybe that just means businesses who put the personal touch in and don't automate their chatbots and stuff will do better. Who knows? Yeah, because I guess it's a very broad term, isn't it? Because, I mean, I mean, I personally feel like whenever I've tried to get a machine to do anything more than something very rudimentary, it's just been an exercise in frustration. Sorry, I didn't understand that. (laughs) Can you please repeat? (laughs) Searching Google for, can you please heat my microwave? 
like I had an issue with PayPal on the weekend um, and I spent probably half an hour to 40 minutes of time trying to like use all the different automation tools they had to fix it and it just nothing worked and I called up a person, I think it was in the United States and within one minute it was fixed. You have to really dive around to find phone numbers though, don't you? Yeah, they, they make it really hard. Because they want to save the money. That's right. It's a lot cheaper to get the machine. Or have you read our fact? It's like, of course I've read your... That was literally the first thing I did. But yeah, it's interesting to say jobs that require human skills such as sales, marketing and customer service should see demand increase. I, like as far as sales go, I feel like sales has almost been decreasing in a lot of ways as far as human skills is concerned. You know what I mean? Look yeah. at something like Amazon, look at eBay, you look at all the different places now where they're really trying to just make the actual selling happen online or happen via computer. I guess when you track forward to 2065, yeah. marketing could probably, you tell a robot, like tell your machine what you want to do. Yeah. And you say, look, we we're trying to plan an event. Or, yeah, we just want to send out some emails. Mm. And then your robot will write it in really cool language yeah. and tailor it to everyone who's on your list. Yeah, they, they said that a major challenge is actually going to be retraining workers. That's going to be a big challenge for governments who will themselves be pressed to update skills, especially in the areas of creativity, cre um, critical thinking and persuasion. It surveyed personnel directors and senior executives from a broad range of companies that account for about 70% of global output. And these executives believe that between now and 2022, aviation, travel and tourism sectors are going to have to retrain workers. Um, and yeah, they also identified a trend towards lifelong learning and ad adaptation. So don't get stuck in a rut. Mm. Keep improving your skill. Yeah, and we're seeing this with all across the workforce, aren't we? People are really focusing on doing new courses, learning new things. Um, I've even, you know, with someone that I work with, she's, uh, she's probably towards the end of her career and she's doing courses to try and teach herself entirely new things. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's becoming a, it, it, whereas like 50 years ago, um, you'd pick your profession, you'd pick what you did and that's what you did. You'd stay in that for the rest of your life. You, mm. you never really have to learn anything new. You'd never really have to change what you were doing, um, let alone a hundred years ago. You know, back that you had your profession, that was pretty much it. Mm. Um, whereas now, it's yeah, seem the focus very much seems to be on continually adapting because things are shifting so quick, and new opportunities are opening up all the time too. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. There was a almost ominous piece of news that came out of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who. Um, are a great group worth donating to. If you haven't come across the EFF before, subscribe to their blog, donate money to them. They basically spend their monies on lawyers suing people who infringe privacy and defending people's privacy world. It's They're sort of America-based, but they're fighting for privacy worldwide. Now, yeah, they've basically reported the following. So according to the EFF, three extreme copyright proposals have passed the European Parliament with dangerous consequences. Yeah, so three proposals passed recently and each of them are catastrophic for free expression, privacy and the arts. The first one is Article 13, which is called the Copyright Filters. And it says that all but the smallest platforms will have to defensively adopt copyright filters that examine everything you post and censor anything judged to be a copyright infringement. Mm. So this is European law trying to force tech companies who operate in Europe to adopt to, copyright. To enforce their laws, yeah. essentially. Like What they're essentially trying to do here is to, to obligate people to be their police force mm. for them. And uh, not only that, but to protect the, the copyrights of any company which has enough money and enough staff to file for patents mm. and to file for trademarks, mm. which if you've ever done anything in copyright law or trademark law, which I've done, um, generally the people that are following these things are the big multinational companies and they will have about two floors of some office somewhere in New York or something that is full of in-house lawyers. All they do day in, day out is file patents and copyright applications. 
And so, it's really, it's a system that's set up to essentially stifle innovation. Um, and you're seeing it now with blockchain too. A lot of these big companies are following all these blockchain patents to try and, you know, get ahead of, and they're like taking open source concepts, which people have developed in the common domain and patenting them and saying, oh, it's like that meme where it's like um, someone gives something to someone else and they're like, I made this. And then the other person is like, oh, you made this. And they think about it for a while and they're like, I made this. <laughs> you know? And they got like a little smile on their face. <laughs> and you can see like there are companies like Tesla, um, they patent things and they don't actually enforce their patents, but they're patenting it so that somebody else doesn't come along and go, I invented this. Yeah. They're patenting it just so they can use it. But yep. still, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So look, I'm not, I'm not saying throw out copyright law altogether, but it's one thing to have the company that's filed for it to in, be enforcing their copyright because they've got a vested interest in, mm. yeah. yeah, making sure that no one copies their thing. It's a whole nother thing to say to, especially tech companies and especially companies like Reddit. And one of the biggest things that we've seen come out of this is people are um, Reddit are currently debating whether they need to enact new principles against memes. Because what memes are, memes are essentially taking copyrighted content from all sorts of movies and TV shows and all sorts mm. of things, putting text over the top of it and posting it up to the internet, mm. which until now has been fine. But this law essentially makes all memes illegal, mm. um, which, is, which is a bit ridiculous. But worse than that, it says that if you don't, if you're a tech company or you're some kind of company hosting content and you don't actively police this, we're going to come after you mm. and we're going to fine you. So the second ridiculous idea that they enforce, now if you, of course, disagree with us here, do jump on our Telegram. We'd love to hear from you. They've suggested that linking to the news using more than one word from an article is prohibited unless you're using a service that bought a license from the news site that you wanted to link to. So in all of our show notes on the FOMO show, these are obviously in violation of these potential... EU laws, mm. um, but we basically link to an article saying, you know, um, EFF says European Parliament passes, la, la, la. Now, us linking all of that text would be illegal or be banned yeah. in the EU, which is kind of stupid. Yeah, it's just... It's it's just really perplexing. Like even the third one, they've actually said. Uh, so there's Article Twelve A as well, which says no posting your own vi photos or videos of sport matches. Only the organisers of sport matches will have the right to publicly post any kind of record of the match. Again, this is something that has been around for a long time with event organisers. So you go to a. I've been to concerts and gigs before where I'll take out my camera. And if it's a big enough place, someone will come down the aisle and say, oh, excuse me, sir, uh, on the terms of our ticket, in terms of the ticket that you bought, you said you wouldn't take photos, so can you please put your phone away? And so I was like, oh, okay, I'll put my phone away. But it's up, it's up to that company to enforce that rule, you know, because that's, a, that's just a rule that they set as part of the ticket. And that's fair enough. It's their ticket. It's their event. They can set whatever rules they want, but they enforce those rules. What's happening here now is the, is the EU is saying, we're going to go a step forward and we're going to enforce those rules. So, you buy a ticket to a sporting event, you go to the sporting event, you take a photo, you're not just breaching the rules of whatever ticket you bought and someone's not just going to come down to you and say, oh, excuse me, sir, can you delete that? The police could come to you, forcibly eject you, fine you and give you a court date because you took a photo at a sport event. So it's it's essentially it's it's just f so far increasing the government's role in essentially enforcing corporate rules, which is what's really worrying, and it's really worrying for the internet because the internet is essentially a form forum for free expression and um, for free exchange of information, and uh, we saw this already with the GDPR privacy rules, but it seems like things are just getting going further and further and further in the EU. Do you reckon it's actually sort of old institutions where you're looking at Hollywood as a big example? They absolutely nosedived during the whole piracy debate where yeah. Spotify came out and they're like, let's work together. And so Hollywood, the, the media industry, I guess you call it the media industry. Yeah. Where Spotify are like, look, let's work together and we'll guarantee your re revenue. And they're like, no, you're just as bad as they are. And it took Spotify a long time to get there. Yeah. But- 
same with a lot of things. And it's almost like they're digging their heels in and they're like, let's just stick, let's bend the world to work with how things used to be in the yeah. 40. Whereas these younger companies, Google, Facebook, whatever, they're just going out like, guys, this is bit, Facebook would just be completely crushed yeah. if they had to enforce copyright. Yeah. yeah. They, they would lose most of their revenue. Yeah. Like yeah. everything on Facebook that you see is copyrighted and illegal. Because the concept of copyright is so archaic. It comes from a time where everything was written on books. Mm. Books were expensive. They were they were valuable and people hoarded the information. Mm. Now books are on the internet. Yeah. And it's information. We, we've got Wikipedia, which is better than any encyclopedia you can ever buy. Um, so the whole information paradigm has completely shifted. And these old laws just aren't like – that. They're archaic. Like, they don't take into account how things work now. Right click, save as is piracy. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of interesting. Yeah. 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 And if, and, it, and like, if you put like some text over the top of what you right clicked and save as, you're defacing copyrighted material. And then you're redistributing. You're a monster. Yeah. <laughs> and to us, like, to us young guys, that's like it, the whole concept that you could even want to stop someone doing that is just ridiculous. Mm. Um, apart from the fact that like memes, like you go to like prequel memes or Marvel meme, whatever the Marvel memes is called, and there's like a Warhammer, all sorts of different memes, Reddits for different um, IP and and you know, movies and all sorts of things. They're from fans, like they're they're people that are engaging with the content every single day and like enjoying engaging with the product. They're just doing it in a new way, you know. And so it's actually really good. Like, if I was looking at that, I'd be like, that's great. They're engaging with our brand every day and they're enjoying it. But for these old types, they're like, well, that's that's our movie and they're, they're putting text over the top of it. It's, uh, it's ridiculous. That's our copyright. Uh, um, mate, is it too much to ask for them to just be a little more progressive? You know, I'm not asking them to be a bleeding heart communist. <laughs> just- <laughs> there comes a point where you're just shouting into the wind, isn't there? You know, like, this train went like 10 years ago. Do you think it's just nothing to worry about and by the time the kids who are born now grow up, they're just going to get the laws changed or they're going to be born into this system of just... Yeah, there will probably come a tipping point because we're definitely... We're, we definitely think like that and there's people our age that think like that. But the next generation, I think a lot more of them are like that. I looked at a survey recently. I don't think I even put it in the show notes, but it was like... No, it wasn't a survey. It was someone from a school talking about Bitcoin and they were saying that they're kind of like the Bitcoin guru at their school in their grade, mm-hmm. but every single kid in the school has a Bitcoin wallet. They're like sending Bitcoin to each other. They're like keeping track of different cryptocurrencies and none of them want to use banks uh. when they grow up because they're just like, why would I when I've got this digital money, which is way better That's crazy. and I can use it on my phone and you know we can send it to each other peer-to-peer to them, that just seems so attractive because I guess they're, they're grown up, they're digital natives, it's the new way of doing things. And so that gives me hope, like seeing that next generation, the fact they seem, and like you hear it so much more, a lot of them are like getting off social media, they don't want anything to do with it anymore. Um, I don't know, like I just, I, I, think you're, I think you're right, like the more people that grow up internet natives, the less and less a lot of this stuff is going to... Mm. Mm. Can you imagine the European Parliament forced Google to ad- adjust Chrome within European countries to block the copy button on the right click menu? <laughs> Wouldn't that just be that would be symbolic? That would be so funny. It would just be symbolic. <laughs> it would. Or if you right click and then it has like copying this image is prohibited. <laughs> But they take the copy away for everything. They're like, you, you no longer can you copy anything. Retype manually. And, <laughs> and then the next but day... But don't steal. <laughs> the next day, the whole EU office can't do anything because like all their staff, all they know how to do is use the copy button. Meanwhile, everyone else has like downloaded a plugin which re-enables yeah. the copy, plug- copy button and they go on their merry way. Uh, wherever you're joining us from, it's a pleasure to have you here. Why not drop into our Telegram channel and say hello? FOMO.show slash Telegram. Okay, a feature this week, mate. I am really excited about this. Collectibles and provably rare smart assets 
there's a lot going on here. What's been exciting you about this for the most? Yeah, so look, first of all, I wish we could have chosen... Like, I, I, I couldn't think of a better title for this. So, Collectibles and Privately Rare Smart Assets is what we're going with. It's actually a lot more interesting than what it sounds like. <laughs> and if you listened in last week, we featured Hash Rush, mm. which is like a computer game built on this whole principle of collectibles and provably rare smart assets. And they're essentially running on a token standard called ERC721. And that's being used for a number of projects. So, it's they're essentially what it does is it uses the blockchain, so the Ethereum blockchain, and it gives people permanence and surety around their real world or digital assets. So, what Hashrush were doing with it is they were saying, you can play our game and the whole back end of our item system in our game is these this token standard. So if you earn a reward in the game or if you earn uh, a special weapon or item, you'll get that rewarded to you, but it will also correspond to a blockchain entry and it'll right. go into your wallet and you'll be able to trade that to someone else and it will have like a specific entry in the blockchain, it'll be provably rare. So it'll be like a provably rare co- collectible. So what does it give you surety of? So it gives you surety of the ownership so that you own the... The asset, first yeah. of all, the, the whatever uh, item you've gotten. Mm-hmm. It gives you transferability because it's on the a token, because like, it's tokenized and it's on the Ethereum network. You can transfer it to someone else and that person you're transferring it to knows that they're getting it. They're getting that mm-hmm. ownership. It also gives you uniqueness. So, because it corresponds to a specific blockchain entry and it's for that specific type of item, which might be very unique, um, then you can... You can say that this is mine and there's nothing else like it. Mm. It corresponds to this thing. And so that works for the game, but it can also be applied to pretty much anything. Right. And so that's what we're gonna we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about this concept of smart assets and uh, provably rare collectibles. Wow. So I guess because the blockchain is immut- an immutable ledger and once something's entered into it, it's there forever. That makes a the perfect place for start, starting to establish who owns what. Yeah, so you could think about, say, a land registry, for mm-hmm. example. And so what we do with a land registry in any kind of country is we use it as a, a way to keep track of who owns what houses. Mm-hmm. So no matter what country you're in, there'll probably be a government land registry. It might mm-hmm. be the state government, it might be the federal government, it might be your local government. And they'll have this, if you're lucky, it's a computer system. All the time, it's like a paper filing system. Mm. And that will keep track of these things called title certificates. And a title certificate is essentially just to print out a piece of paper and it just notes down who owns the property mm. and it's so and, and who has what's called like encumbrances over the property. So, for example, in here in Australia, if you print out a title certificate, the first thing it will say is at, right at the top of the owner, it'll say the crown. Because in our country, the crown owns everything and they have the last say in things. And what they will give you is a title in any kind of property. Mm-hmm. And so generally the second owner, the second person on the list will be the people that actually own the property. Right. So if I own a property, it'd say Matt, uh, Matt Shearing, you know, owns this property. And then what will happen is there might be encumbrances. So it might say Commonwealth Bank has an encumbrance over the property because right. they really are the ones that own like 90% right. of the property, right. for example, because they've given the mortgage to whoever owns it. So, it'll list out all the people that have an interest in that property. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want to sell that property, what you've got to do is you've got to, first of all, go to a law firm and say, this system is so archaic, I don't know how to deal with it and we're, we've got to sell our house so we need someone to represent us. And the law firm will say, okay, we'll help you. And then when the time comes, let's say you've found a, found a buyer, someone who's willing to buy your house, and you, the time comes, all the money's going to different places and you want to transfer the property. You'll send a request to this land titles registry. All going well, they will say, okay, we've got your documents. We're going to update the title. They'll do away with your title certificate. They'll issue a new title certificate, but it will have the same like lot number and property number at the top, mm-hmm. which is kind of like the reference number for that property. Mm. And so the names will change, but the property references will stay the same. A lot of the time what happens is you you message the land titles registry. You say, hey, here's all the documents. They come back and they say, uh, hello, dear sir or madam. Um, we have examined your documents and we have found that... Uh, Clause 7 of your request to transfer the property does not comply with Clause 422, subsection A, subsection I, subsection B, subsection V of the Land Titles Registry. We are now requisitioning this. Please get us in in touch with us when you fix the problem. And so 
what then happens is your law firm has to expend a whole bunch more money, time and, time mm. and money to fix, I don't know, a semicolon being in the wrong place mm. or something. Mm. Because the land titles registry, they've got a monopoly on recording who owns the property. And it's essentially a shared fiction. We're sitting here in a house right now and there's an owner of this property mm. where we're sitting mm. right now. But the only thing that ties that owner to this property is that registry somewhere in a government building somewhere which keeps track of all the stuff. You hope okay. they take regular backups, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So there's right now there isn't a lot of visibility into these ledges. Um, I mean, you've had a bit of experience with this. Yeah, and it's, it's horrible. There's no way you can really go to just print out everyone who owns everything. You've generally got to pay a fee. You've got to have the lot number and the there's like all these. You can't just look up a street number generally. You've got to like find out lot numbers and all sorts of different weird things. Wow, um, it's very archaic. And look, th- that's not just that's just one specific example. And I just use that as an illustration because it applies to nearly everything in our society. We track ownership through registries and through ledgers. Mm-hmm. And money's the perfect example, and it's why the blockchain. That's why Bitcoin was such a big thing initially because it was tracking money. But Mm -hmm. it applies to pretty much everything else in our world. So these these systems are built up and they're very inefficient and uh, and tracking who owns what becomes very difficult. So this has been a huge problem in gaming. I mean, some of our listeners have probably come across this before. Is counterfeit items is a massive market for trading items. So therefore, there's a massive market for fraud. Um, And things can go really wrong. I mean, you've got... CSGO, which is Counter-Strike Global Operations or something. There's Dota 2, which means no idea what that means. <laughs> what does Dota 2 stand for? D- um, the original Dota was Defense of the Ancients. But it's like, it's, oh, like wow. a, it's like the original MOBA game. So what League of Legends became, um, if you've heard of League of Legends, right. um, it's, it originated from Dota, and Dota's right. like the successor of that. Right. So it's right. like five people versus five people, and they each have a hero. But mm. there's all these items that right. are built in with that. And especially on Steam, you can, which is a gaming platform, you can try and trade items to each other. And there's a whole bunch of third party sites mm. that are built up around that. And they're purely focused on trading items. And I think I saw a stat somewhere where it was like for every two items that someone may trade, there's another four that are fake. Right. So, like, it's a massive problem at the moment because Mm. these third-party websites are essentially acting as, like, marketplaces for these items, but there's no real way to tell whether Mm. the item that you're buying is real or if it's fake. Um, So, I guess here enters our hero, public blockchains. Yeah, so with the land titles registry or with the gaming uh, items or with anything else that you might want to track... At the moment, visibility is a huge issue. And wherever you don't have visibility, you have fraud and mm. you have um, inefficiency. Public blockchains give visibility to everyone. You can see every single transaction on the blockchain, which means that you've got a level playing field to exchange information out in the open, mm. which is a big deal. Okay, so it can, it can be useful, but isn't blockchain only good at sending money at the moment? How do they do it with assets? I mean, especially real world ones. I mean, there's a, another component to it. Yeah, when you're just handing things over. How does that work? Yeah, so the way that people started solving this was with Ethereum. So Mm -hmm. Bitcoin was essentially just a network for trading money. Ethereum became a network for trading money and attaching information to it, or even just trading information. Mm -hmm. And they did that through these smart contracts. And smart contracts are essentially just programs that run on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So you set the rules of the program, you push it to the blockchain, it's there for everyone to see, and you know how it's going to behave. Mm. And so, early on, one of the first token protocols that people came up with for these smart contracts was ERC-20. And ERC-20 is a smart contract standard which allows you to deploy a single type of token to an Ethereum distributed network. And most of you guys are probably familiar with this. So, ERC-20 is the way that most of the ICO tokens work. Right. So, it's it's basically everyone gets the same type of token. Mm -hmm. Every token has the same properties. You can hold more or less of that token, uh, but you can make as much as you want of that token and no token is more special than any other token. Right. So it's just like a unit of exchange. Right. And it may have some extra properties dependent on the smart contract. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, Aragon's token on the Aragon network, you get some like governance properties. Right, you can right. do different things other than just exchanging money. 
So a token is just that. It's it's token. It just represents something somewhere else. It just represents a piece of information or, or, or a certain way a program works right. or an Ethereum network. Cool. So Summits is simply just as simple as a unit of transaction on an application. So a lot of these distributed applications that people are building on the Ethereum network, mm-hmm. they use a token as like their unit of exchange. Right. So these kind of tokens, because they're, they're running with ICOs and they're running with different projects who want to like exchange value mm-hmm. within their applications – are designed for what's called fungibility. So, in economics, fungibility, it's the property or uh, of a good or a commodity whose individual units are essentially interchangeable. So, for example, since one kilogram of pure gold is equivalent to any other uh, qu- uh, kilogram of pure gold, whether it's in the form of coins, ingots, which is like bars or in other states, gold is fungible. So this allows a platform to build an economy of its own and have units of exchange which conform to the rules of whichever smart contract they've been deployed with. So it's a really powerful token standard. Uh, It's been vetted by a number of people in the community and it allows you to essentially say, okay, here's our unit of exchange and these are the rules which conform to it. But it's very inflexible in that everything's exactly the same. So, yeah, you've got that. They're all exactly the same. So you've then got this other standard on non-fungible tokens. What is that standard? What does it mean? Yeah, so it's called ERC721. And these all have different um, uh, numbers because they're essentially different proposals Mm -hmm. on the Ethereum network of different types of smart contracts. And from the ERC721 website, it says ERC721 is a free open standard that describes how to build non-fungible or unique tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. While most tokens are fungible, every token is the same as every other token, ERC721 tokens are all unique. So you essentially want to think of them like rare, one-of-a-kind collectibles. So why was it built? So like usual Gaming really led the way. And we see this in a lot of industries. And a lot of emergent tech kind of comes out of gaming. And uh, this ERC721 standard was made by Dieter Shirley or at Diet on GitHub. Mm -hmm. And he was the creator of CryptoKitties. Right. So CryptoKitties was the first to take the concept and implement it practically. And how they implemented it was they essentially said, we've got an application that we've built on top of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And we've also got like a web interface uh, that that is paired with it. Hmm. And we've got these great new things called crypto kitties. And crypto yeah. kitties are essentially like unique kittens that inherit certain traits from their I think it's from like their parents. Right. So I started with a number of crypto kitties and, and the each one was essentially a, a separate little token hmm. that corresponded to like a a, a piece of art. For, for a kitty. Right, yeah. And then these kitties, I think, started breeding with each other mm-hmm. and they'd spawn new kitties and then new kitties. And a- each one would look different and they'd all look unique and they'd have different features. But if every single kitty had an entry on the blockchain, it was unique, you could prove that, yep, that kitten is unlike any other kitten out there. Mm. And so people started trading it to each other because they were provably rare. Mm. And it's just like, you know, baseball cards in America or we used to have cricket cards here in Australia, coins or stamps or anything else. If someone knows that something's rare, mm. generally it's it be- instantly becomes yeah. more valuable. And so around the time that the big ICO craze was going on in December was around the time that this Crypto Kitties launched its first beta and it caught up steam really, really quickly. The problem was that if you wanted to trade a crypto kitty to someone else. It was its own little contract, its own little token. You could only send one at a time. It was all quite slow and it started clogging up the network. Right. So I guess here comes in the ERC1155 standard. What is that? Yeah, so ERC1155 was essentially saying, well, why don't we have both? At the moment, we've got ERC20, which is like one contract for a whole bunch of tokens. So it all you can send tokens to each other, but it's like one one token. ERC721 was like, we're going to have a separate token for each thing on the blockchain and it's going to be unlike anything else. Right. Um, so if you want to just if you want to send that token to someone else, it's going to need to be its own transaction. Right. If you're going to send another token to someone else, it's going to need to be its own transaction. And so they said, well, if this is going to work for gaming, 
there is going to be a need to have boats. So we're going to need to have like some common items, which are fungible. So we talked before about the gold. Gold, no matter what state it's in, it's still gold. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have like healing potions or ammo Mm -hmm. for guns Mm -hmm. or something in a game, it would make a lot more sense uh, if you're going to put a put them on a some kind of blockchain thing to have them ERC20 token. Right. You can have many, many types of ammo and they all are exactly the same. They're all fungible. Each ammo is like every other type of ammo. But then if you've got like a whole bunch of guns or a whole bunch of, I don't know, staffs or axes or something in your game, um, but you want a lot of them to be unique and mm. special, mm. you also need the ERC721 type things mm. to to make it so that Someone can say, well, I did this dungeon, I got this crazy shiny axe and it's not like anyone else's axe. Right. It's got its own entry on the blockchain. Mm. And you want that for your axe, but you don't necessarily want that for your individual unit of ammo or your healing mm. vial mm. or something because they're common. Mm. So they said, well, if this is going to work for games, then we need to bring both together. Um, so we'll have the fungible and the non-fungible and the ERC-1155 is designed to allow both. Okay. So, was this Engine that created this standard? Yeah, so the creators of Engine, who we've talked about before, they're essentially like already quite a big name in the gaming sphere and they've got what's called Engine Coin. They were the people that came up with this. So, if you uh, haven't heard about Engine before, check out episode 10 of the FOMO show. Um, we had a great little feature on game coins, and Engine was a big feature in that. From their blog post introducing the standard, they said that ERC1155 crypto items improve by um, on what we've mentioned as the problems already. By combining the benefits of both, you may create thousands of different types of items for your game. And depending on the use case, each unit may have a unique index or be fully fungible with the others. These NFTs, non-fungible tokens, I think that means, um, may still be treated as a group within the contract. So they still retain a sort of fungibility. You'll be able to know that your token is a machine gun and that it's um, of the unique serial number 1234. Yeah, so essentially you're going to be able to have classes. So the machine gun might be the class, right. but within that class you'll have individual. So the, the class might be completely fungible. Yeah, you know, machine guns. Every machine gun is like the other machine gun, but within that, if you put your, your machine gun up to your face, you might see that it's got the number one, two, three, four on it, and that's unique. Right. So you're kind of combining both there. So you might be able to say. Um, let's say it's a car game, for example, mm. and they put a bunch of Ferraris in the car game. There might be a hundred Ferrari Enzos, mm-hmm. but you might be able to say, I've got number one. Mm. I've got the number one Ferrari mm. Enzo. And while you've all got Ferrari Enzos that look just like mine and in, on the blockchain, their class is still mm. Ferrari Enzo, I've got number one and I can prove it mm. because it's right here on the blockchain. That's really cool. And you can't counterfeit that. Because it's open to everyone wow. and everyone can see. And so that's that's the real power of what they're trying to do. They're essentially saying to game developers that you can make the backbone of your game on this ERC-1155 and you can build it just like you'd normally build it, but you just plug in our... Uh, what, and this is what Engine are doing. They're saying plug in our functionality and you can also give it blockchain personality and people can start to create extra value by trading all this stuff. And That's your awesome. customers will also know that their stuff is legit because it will mm. correspond to the the end the, that like they'll be able to order it on the blockchain mm. and see that it's legit. So we, all the developer needs to do is just plug it in. They just need to implement it. They don't need to be a blockchain expert, cryptography, this or anything like that. They just build their game and just plug it in where it's needed. That's exactly right. So that's that's what Engine are trying to do. So mm. we've talked, like I said, we've talked about Engine before. They're a gaming management platform. They're guilds. They're an established brand, but they've been building a marketplace for these items already, which is backed by ERC twenty one, but now also ERC one one five five. And so they've pushed this new token standard into their marketplace, and they've built a whole bunch of tools around it. And you can go on their website right now and you can look at it. And uh, they're essentially saying to developers, look, hey, here's this stuff. If you want to start implementing it, let us know. We can get you the tools you need behind the scenes to plug it all in via APIs and everything else. And 
all you've got to do is use our marketplace. So that's kind of where they're getting their value is they're saying you've got to use the engine coin and you've got to use our mark our wider marketplace to do it. So they're still essentially pulling people into their platform. But the, t- the token standard's open. So if you're a developer and you say, well, I don't really want to use engine's platform, but I love the standard, I'm going to build my own, then you can. Hmm. And, uh, and what the beauty of something like th- this means is that if you've got these tokens out there, you can, as a developer, start to say, well, okay, um, we know there's a company in Europe who is building a real-time strategy game like Hash Rush. Hmm. We want to build a fantasy game like Elder Scrolls or something. Wouldn't it be cool is it, if you get a rare item in Hash Rush and it's traded to someone else who plays our game that they're able to log into our game and use that item in our game? Mm. or get some different item because they've got that item in our game. And so you start to open up, because of that level playing field, Mm -hmm. you start to open up the possibility of kind of having like a cross-pollination between different games Mm. and between different applications. So uh, you were talking about this before we started recording, but you were saying that there's a huge benefit to this because, you know, Gamers want to be able to move between games and sometimes you'll stop playing one game and start playing another one. Mm. So it means that if you've been playing a like a new game for a short while, but then you're like, oh, you know, I'm going to stop playing the game I used to be playing and I want to move on to this. Yep. All your items from your old game, in the future, the potential is that you could actually trade those items away and exchange it for some sort of value that you can bring into your new game. Yeah, yeah. So they've got this. They've got this system where you can essentially take your items and say, "Well, I don't need these items anymore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to melt them, and you run them through like what they call a melter, and you you essentially cash your items in, and they'll have like a market value because this is all be trading on a marketplace, mm-hmm. and you'll be able to say, okay, well, for seventy five percent of market value, I can melt this down into engine coin." And then when I come into the new game, I'll be able to buy some new items with this or I'll be able to cash it out, maybe make some real cash or something mm. like that from my items. Um, it adds a whole other aspect to games and it would really, I mean, from what I'm seeing, it could really add a it adds a third dimension onto a lot of these games. So you've got the games, you've got all the fun that you're having there, but now you've got, oh, I imagine being able to explore, you know, who are the big whales in Dota 2, and you can see, oh, these big people have all these items. Yeah. And it's it's sort of an, an interesting sort of open book on into those gaming worlds. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're getting all the benefits of an open distributed network, which is what the blockchain is, but you're, you're adding some extra value by hooking it into games and t- t- tying all your in-game items to these things. So I know that um, one of the early games, we've got a few friends here in Brisbane who have been really into Engine and what they're doing. And one of these first games, they stayed up like all night to try and get these rare crystals from this game. And essentially you had to like hatch the crystals or something. I can't remember exactly how it worked. But once these crystals hatched, you got like this special creature or item or something that was very specific. I think they've only... There's only like 500 crystals or something like some really small number, and they're never ever going to be run again. They're like a wow. first kind of like let's say for example, some they did a first run of Pokemon cards, and they mm-hmm. only ever made a thousand of them, and that was it. Could you like imagine how much those would be worth now? You probably buy a full original set of Pokemon cards for two thousand dollars or something now. Mm-hmm. But if you if you bought the first original set. It would be worth, I don't know, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. People crazy. will pay a lot yeah. for like being the first or having something rare. And so they were really excited about this because they were like, We've got this provably rare asset. No one's gonna be able to deny that this is what it what we say it is. You know, we don't have to worry about people saying we're counterfeiting it. So they're seeing the value in that. But if you then zoom out and you say, Well, okay, that's great for gaming, but what about mm. everything else? Mm. You can start to see the application in a wider sphere. So uh, help me skip forward to that point where you are right now. What other sort of applications are you seeing this in? Well, let's take the example of houses, Mm. what we were talking about before. Mm. Everyone has a house. Mm -hmm. So a house can be, that's a class, Mm kind of like the Ferraris we talked about before. Mm. That house is a class. But within those sets of houses, you've got all sorts of different, you've got house on one John Smith Street, to John Smith, you know, mm. you've got all these unique houses within 
that subset. And if, if you be, begin to bring then something like houses onto that system, you've got an open ledger, which is open to everyone. You can provably show that you have ownership of that asset. Mm-hmm. And if you want to trade ownership of that asset, it would be a lot easier within that tokenized system yeah. to be able to trade ownership of that asset. And you could begin to build some smart contract functionality around the mm-hmm. trading of those houses because it would just be the rules of the larger contract. Mm. So the land titles registry, for example, could say, okay, we're going to build a housing contract on ERC-1155. Here are the rules. And everything now complies with our specific version of this token standard. And if you want to trade a house, and all of a sudden the housing market becomes a lot more fungible. Mm. You can see them applying it. I mean, I'm taking a really obvious similar example, but I mean, every car has a VIN number or something like that, like a vehicle. I I don't know if that's unique to each car, but I mean... yeah. It's it's you can see it can pretty easily spread to a lot of other things that we do and then yeah, it can just yeah, you just have smart contracts and a few things that sort of get put in place. But well warranties. Like you think of something like a warranty, you know, mm. like a warranty at the moment it's really hard to work out who like if you bring a piece of equipment to a store and say, Oh, this broke, they'll say, Where's your docket? Oh, I don't have the docket. Mm. And they're like, well, how are we meant to know that this is what we sold you? Mm. You know, where, where's, there's no registry for them to go to unless there's a few stores out there that will like take your name mm. when they sell you something, but a lot of them won't. You'll just go, buy it over the counter, away you go. And you've got like a two year warranty on that thing. But if you bring it back and you don't have the docket, they're going to be like, sorry, can't do anything for you. You don't have the docket. Mm. We don't know that it's yours. Mm. But, with something like a this kind of registry system where everything corresponds to a unique identifier, all you need to do is have that smart asset, quote unquote, in your wallet and you take it back for warranty and they'd say, how do we know it's yours? Well, here it is in my wallet. Mm, that's really cool. And they just look it up. Oh, yeah, that's it. It's, you can't forge it because it's on a publicly recorded blockchain and it complies to the rules of the, the smart contract. That's the big deal. You know, the, the companies that make this stuff will be able to make their own rules as to how these smart contracts get rolled out mm. and they'll be the ones controlling, you know, the rules of their token standard. Mm. But all you got to do is show that it's in your wallet. It's assigned to your identification and that's it. That's crazy. You've got your warranty and they'll be able to look, oh, yeah, it was manufactured then, it was sold on that date, cool. Mm. We'll fix it for you. That's really like the 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 tokenization of real world unique and even non unique assets is a really it's a really interesting sort of direction that we could go in because mm. you can sort of see a bunch of other things like other bits of metadata that you can plug onto that. I mean, mm. you could actually bring a lot of other systems together. Yeah. Um. You know your your water bill. You know you apply it to a house, and then it's like, oh, here it is. And the way that systems could work more efficiently just by having that sort of shared database. Yeah. Could be brilliant. Yep, and you can start to build all sorts of other contracts and applications yeah. that plug into that stuff to automate a lot of that. And it's wild. Um, Someone's got to patent this. <laughs> well, it's an open standard, which is great. Fantastic. Um, so, and, and credit to Engine, like they've developed this thing behind the scenes, but they're not like this is our proprietary tech. This standard is out there for anyone to use. Wow. As usual, gaming is leading the way. Uh, which it often does, like VR is the same, all sorts of other technology, personal computing, everything. But w- once you kind of dig down into how all this stuff works and what it does, you can see it applying to so many other areas and it has the potential to really change the way that a lot of things work. Yeah, so uh, we'll put the link in the show notes for Engine. This wasn't a sponsored segment by Engine, but these guys, they're the guys that are out there implementing a lot of this stuff. So mm. check them out, have a play around with it and... Uh, yeah, watch this space. Like, we'll keep our finger on this pulse and, and see where this goes because it, it's very, very interesting. So, this week in our privacy and security segment, we are going to talk about malware and uh, some of the ways that you can manage it. Mm. So, malware is basically software that's designed to damage your computer um, and, well, yeah, damage computer systems so you may you've probably experienced this before it could consist of viruses whether it's ransomware where it encrypts your computer and locks you out from accessing it without giving some romanian or anyone really um, from 
locking your computer off and you've got to pay a ransom to use your computer. You've got malicious websites where they're mining cryptocurrency on your computer or trying to send you to a fake website and, and cause you damage that way. But often traditional antiviruses can't stop a lot of these things. Yeah, so it's essentially software that gains control of your system somehow and does something you don't really want it to do and yeah. you don't really even know that it's going on a exactly. lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's, it's particularly prevalent on Windows and Android machines, isn't mm, it? Mm, yeah, I mean, some of our listeners probably know the pain and some of us have probably had to pay through the nose for some overpriced software to try and stop it. Mm. But it's a very real threat, though. Yeah, it's, it's becoming a lot more real now, too, isn't it? Mm. Like, it seems like every day you're hearing about some new ransomware or malware attack on big corporations or individuals. And especially since we're a tech show and we're, we're talking a lot about cryptocurrencies, it's particularly relevant for us because we don't want anyone to get control of our computer mm. because that's where we keep mm. a lot of mm. our... Uh, of our crypto, our money. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of our listeners do as well. Now, if you're relying on something like Windows Defender to keep you safe, you probably need to get some other solution as well. And having a couple different antivirus, anti-malware systems there is not a bad thing necessarily. Mm. Um, but, I mean, you look at it, We've in 10 years... We've had 10 different versions of Windows and in those 10 versions, well, I don't know how many versions, but every version is, you know, up, you know as it upgrades, more there are flaws in every single one of them. Yeah. And every day people are fight, discovering more of them and then there's more software plugging onto these things. So there are more different attack vectors every day, which is probably why we're hearing more about this because yeah. every update means, you know, some things are patched and some things are even wider open. Yeah, and the problem with Windows too particularly is that you can it doesn't split what we call the user space in the same way that something like Linux does. Hmm. Um so on Windows you've got these little things called EXEs, which everyone would have seen. If you've used Windows, you download something from the internet, it's an EXE. What an EXE does is it essentially runs something at a heightened level of account control. Mm. So on Linux, if you run a, if you want to run something as administrator, you have to specifically put in the password and say, I want to run this as administrator. Mm. And nothing else will run mm. as administrator unless it has that password. So that's why Linux is very resistant to these kind of malware and ransomware and uh, these kind of attacks because mm. it's a lot harder to build a virus for Linux. But with Windows, all you need to do is open like a Word document or an EXE or something else that's executable and it can quite quickly take control of mm. a lot more of your mm. computer. Mm. Mm. And with these exploits, it's good to have some sort of solution for it. Mm. Now, I personally have been using malware bytes for a couple of years. Um, I was just using the free version. Just it's it's a blazing fast anti malware antivirus system, which is pretty comprehensive and it's super fast. Yep. You'll notice with a lot of antivirus programs, it'll take a long time to scan your computer. But malware bytes is really really advanced. And I mean, I was first recommended it by a uh, by a computer expert who I, who I know and I've been using it ever since but it's super fast and it protects you from a bunch of these things you'll notice if you're running malware bytes you click on a potentially dodgy link and it will block the pop-up before it's even happened it won't mm. even have a chance to execute any bad code or javascript or anything like that block you block phishing websites before they even arrive and they're really quick on updating their systems in the past it's been found that malware bytes actually protect you from a lot of things that other antivirus and anti-malware software doesn't protect you from. So it's pretty cool. And there are some other solutions as well. What, what sort of antivirus? Have you used any sort of antivirus programs in the past? Yeah, yeah. So I've used a few different ones. I used to use AVG back in the oh, day. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. recommend them anymore. They were they were good back in the day, but they've, mm. I think they've kind of gone a bit by the wayside. I've used McAfee mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. um, the one that I kind of use currently on both my Android and my Windows stuff is Avast. Oh, yeah. yeah. From a free options from an antivirus standpoint, Avast, I think, is still probably one of the best. Mm -hmm. um, I p usually pair it with the Windows Defender just because they do push out a number of updates to that. And then I use Malwarebytes as well. So I've always got Malwarebytes on my system. Um, 
What else have I used? I, there's probably been a few Bit others. Defender. I've used Bit Defender before mm. as well. Um, I use a lot of so from a browser perspective, mm. I generally use either Firefox or Brave. Mm-hmm. Uh, Firefox is normally my go-to, and I use Privacy Badger. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I use uBlock Origin. Mm-hmm. I use HTTPS everywhere. Right. I use a bunch of plugins to essentially make it as hard as possible for me to click on a link that will do something bad, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So, because I, I haven't paid for malware bytes, so I have to manually scan all the time. Obviously, I use a VPN everywhere too. So, and that's that's another step to try and mitigate a lot of the the risk. But have you, you you've used Kaspersky before? Have you? Or? I haven't used Kaspersky, okay. but I've like I've always heard of it. Like they've always had a great reputation. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's been smashed a bit recently. But yeah. Kaspersky, I've heard pretty good things from, and Sophos as well. They yeah. used to be at least great. Yeah. I have a feeling they still are a great name. In They're it. more enterprise too, aren't they? They are. Yeah. 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 But, um, they do have some sort of consumer bits as well. Okay. Aware, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically, if you're if you're using Windows, it's essentially like you're sailing in a leaky boat, and you're these virus protection things and and malware protection things are essentially like get employing people to to run around the ship and try and find the holes that are appearing as soon as they mm, appear and patch them. Mm, mm. So you're never going to be completely safe, but it's a lot better to have some programs that are doing this stuff mm, for you mm. than just running completely naked. So, yeah, and if you've got any sort of serious money that's on your computer, it's probably worth – if if it's if it's worth more than a week of your paycheck – it's probably worth a couple of days, well, one day of pay to get two years of protection. It's worth being, it's worth being safe because a lot of people, like I personally, like I've been sitting around for years being like, ah, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But <laughs> you see people whose houses have burnt down and they're like, I should have just got fire insurance. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll chuck a link to Malwarebytes in the, in the show notes mm. and you can get a free trial. I think it's... Oh, is it 30 days or something you get with Yeah, them? 14 days you yeah. get just it, – it updates and real-time scans. But after that, you basically can scan your computer on demand. So every time you go on the internet and you feel like you clicked on some dodgy link, scan your whole computer. It will do it really quickly. Um, the only benefit of paying is it just updates in real time and scans in real time. Yep. Okay. And you can get that for your phone as well. Get it for your phone. Yeah. So cool. it protects you. And phones can are just filth. I mean, yeah. j- d- those things are like the jacuzzi of the <laughs> device security world. <laughs> you know what I mean, it's just that's a horrible image. <laughs> Oh, isn't that oh, it's like a film? There's like a film on top of the wall. Oh, mate! Oh, and you got to peel it back. And oh. Those things are a bit seriously. Like even just with forgetting regular like computer viruses, those things are filth. Seriously? Yeah, just your phone. You're holding it against your face all day. I, mine's currently sitting on the carpet. Yep. <laughs> yep. And I'll put it on against my face again. Get malware protection. Get malware protection. And clean your phone. So if you've listened to the FOMO show before, you would have heard one of our notorious guests, um, Dan Dan, the ICO man, fantastic visionary. Mm. Um, I got a text from him earlier this week, said he'd um, been going through some changes. Um, be interesting to catch up and see what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, we haven't heard from him in a while. And look, Dan is the kind of guy that if you leave him alone for two or four weeks, he is probably going to have something completely new. And got himself into a whole lot more trouble and probably made a lot more money too. Mm, so Probably sold some of your stuff. That's right. Look, I mean, the, there, no one wants a completely immutable, traceable blockchain less than Dan because he thrives in the grey areas. Mm. Mm. Let's give him a call. Hey, Dan, are you there? Joe, is that you? Yeah, man. How you doing? Joe, it has been too long. I keep saying to all the guys, when is Joe going to call me? He only calls me all the time to hear what I've been up to. Joe, it is just really good to hear your voice, man. I have missed talking to you so much. What are you doing? 
Oh, it's been way too long. I mean, I meant to call you the last couple of weeks, but I ended up calling Jordan. I mean, he's been going through enough as it was, but um, um, I heard that you'd been through some changes. What are you, what are you, what's been going on with you? Well, Joe, you know, I'm always completely honest with you. I got to admit, this bear market is just going on for too long, Joe. There's only so long... I can sell people ICOs when no one wants to buy ICOs, Joe. I mean, the market has completely died. So here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm swimming around my pool of dollar-dollar bills, Joe. I'm diving in there like Scrooge McDuff, and I'm, I'm thinking all the while. I'm thinking, how can Dan turn this negative into a positive? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, what, what is the biggest problem in this industry right now, Joe? That's what I'm thinking about. So what problem have you landed on? Well, Joe, the biggest problem I'm seeing, the reason people are so reticent to buy these these ICO tokens, Joe, is because the regulators aren't supporting it, Joe. I mean, they're going after BitConnect, one of the greatest ICOs of all time, really quality guys, Joe. They're going after several other projects, Joe. No one knows whether this stuff's legal or not, no matter what hack lawyer you get to tell you. So, Joe, I thought, well, why don't I flip the tables? Why don't I go and work for the very people that are causing the market to drop so much. Unbelievable. Joe, so I I walk down Wall Street, Joe, and you know I'm a familiar face on Wall Street. Mm. People know Dan Dan the ICO man. They're waving. They're stopping and honking their horns. They're saying, thanks for the 10x on Nano, Dan. That's, That's great. So I walk into the SEC offices and all the time I'm thinking, well, I saw Jordan do this with News Corp. I heard about him on the FOMO show. So why can't Dan go and work for the SEC? So I walk in and I say, I'd like to talk to the director of the SEC. My name's Dan Dan, the ICO man. You might have heard of me on TV. So they say, yeah, come on in. We, we, we were actually looking for more people. Let's get you an interview. Wonderful. So how did it go? Joe, it went amazingly. I went in there, I gave them my 10-point plan for turning around the SEC. And by the end of it, Joe, they were so keen to have me on, they couldn't wait to sign on the dotted line. I haven't even signed a contract, Joe. I'm in here, I'm in the offices, and I'm finally in the seat of power, Joe. And you know what I'm doing? I'll tell you what I'm doing, Joe. I am taking every one of these ICO projects. I'm getting my rubber stamp, and I'm stamping it. I'm saying, SEC approved. SEC approved. SEC approved. Dan Dan, the ICO man, is going to drag this industry back into the green single-handedly, Joe. You are an absolute market maker, I believe is what we'd call that. You're a market maker. You're you're creating industry out of thin air. This is brilliant. So, I mean, how's it been so far? I mean, you must have been very busy. We've had more ICO projects come through these doors in the last two weeks than the last six months, Joe. It seems like everyone wants to sell these ICOs. And market sentiment's up, Joe. People are starting to get interested again. It's amazing what having the rubber stamp of a regulator will do. Wow. Sheesh, the halls of power really echoing the name of Dan on you. That's insane. So... Dan, what are your next steps? What's the vision 2025 SEC? How are you going to, you you know, you've got this 10 point plan. How's it, how's it been? What's next? Well, Joe, there's some really nice confidence in this market now, Joe. But I've been telling the guys here at the SEC, I'm saying, look, you guys have got to throw off the shackles of what people think of you for too long. You've brought the hammer down on people. You've made people afraid. Instead, you need to be people's friends, Joe. You need to get in there in the trenches with them and say, we're with you. You need to love the government and the SEC. So, Joe, what I propose to them, Dan Dan gets out his complete ICO success formula, and he says, fellas, buckle up. Why don't we do our own ICO? Why doesn't the SEC bring out SEC coin or SEC coin, as I call it, Joe? And wouldn't you believe it, Joe? The idea has been an amazing success. Everyone's into it. Picture this, Joe. Set coin backed by the U.S. government. Don't worry about all these other ICOs. This is the biggest ICO of the century. The SEC ICO. This is brilliant, Dan. Where, where, so, so what happened when you floated out the chain of command? 
I did not think I was big enough deal to get a helicopter to the White House to meet the president himself. He loves the idea, Joe. He is so on board with SEC coin. He said, yes, we can to the idea. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to send you the link to this ICO, Joe. I want the FOMO listeners. You guys are being loyal to me. Dan Dan is about to make it as big as he's ever made it in his life with SEC coin. I'm going to send you the link to the pre-pre-pre-sale. Your customers can get KYC. They can get all set up for this ICO. I mean, Joe, it is going to be the biggest thing ever. They can sign up to it there. They can buy in at the basement level, Joe, and they will be a part of history. You are about to go stratospheric, Dan. This is insane. Look, I got to go. I have got so many people to sell this to in the government sector. You would not believe the interest. These guys are so keen to make money. So I'll see you later, Joe. Bye. Wow, finally, Dan is on the right side of an SEC meeting. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a bit confused to be honest because it's it sounds like he's gone into the one of the most notorious places for coming down on ICOs, and he's brought them all around to thinking it's an amazing idea. He's a natural salesman. He's a born swindler. If he's convinced the the president of the United States, he must be onto something. Yeah, I guess so. I, I mean, think we're wrong in this case. Yeah, I'm just really interested to see where this goes. So yeah. I guess uh, we might even have to call him next episode and see see what's going on. Yeah. Do you know someone who might enjoy this? Uh, please feel free to share it with them. You can find us at FOMO.show. You can jump in on our Telegram chat channel and say hello at FOMO.show slash Telegram. You can follow us on Twitter at the underscore FOMO underscore show. And Facebook at Facebook.com slash the FOMO show. And YouTube at FOMO.show slash YouTube. That's it for us here at the FOMO show. Thank you so much for joining us. If you like it, please do feel free to subscribe via the podcast app of choice or via our YouTube channel. I'm Matt. And I'm Joe. And as always, remember... No fun. when it all goes wrong pear shaped <laughs> pear yourself. shaped is such a great <laughs> description you know it's such a fantastic man the English language is fantastic mm. just like ripple isn't ripple fantastic <laughs> it just it just went above Ethereum in market cap which what? means it's the second biggest cryptocurrency in the world despite the fact that it's token is completely detached from its use case. Does that not just... Mate, meanwhile, Pivex, which is a currency that both of us love, yep. I saw was at $1.06 Australian the mm. other day. Mm. And I'm sitting there like, wow, this is a pretty great project, but it's real yep. cheap. Proof of stake, privacy coin. I just called it privacy. I used to say privacy <laughs> until I met <laughs> you. You privacy <laughs> all my days. We have converted another one. Oh, dear. Things have really changed. Join us in the. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I'm becoming Joe. <laughs> You'll tune in in a couple more years and we'll just sound exactly the same. <laughs> ah, good chaps. What, what? <laughs> Welcome to the old, uh, experience. Good. Yes, yes, yes. Here we are at the FOMO show. Jolly. Uh, good talking stuff. about privacy coins. Lovely day for a spot of cricket. <laughs> yes. Go down to Trafalgar Square and uh, think on the uh, majesty of of our uh, sweet system. monarch. <laughs> if you can, please contact the FOMO show at FOMO show at protonmail.com and tell us what on earth we are talking about. Emails may be recorded for quality and fact verification purposes. I was yeah. listening to that this morning. And it was, it was really good. And I was working and I was like... Hold on, what? <laughs> yeah. 
Because they had like I think it was like three episodes in one, and they had the um the company yeah. that had like penetration tested. Oh, the wrong company. The wrong company. That was a great Everything story. was similar. So basically what happened is there was a company that did penetration testing. So basically you pay a company of hackers to hack into you, but they're good hackers because they try and find all your weak spots and fix them. Mm. Um, I work for a company that does that. It's really interesting. Mm. Um but yeah, so they were given an IP address range, range of addresses to attack from their client. The client gave them the wrong address. Um, unbeknownst to them, they hacked into the systems, found a bunch of admin stuff, la la la, and then they were like, "Here's a report." We fell la la la, and the client's like, "Oh, that's not our IP address," and they're like, "Ah." <laughs> so they'd hacked into the wrong company. Yeah. So then they get their lawyers in the room, every, their legal they like, work all through the weekend. Yeah, and they're like getting ready to say, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry." They phone them up, they're like, "I'm so sorry, we've hacked into your whole networks and we have everything," and they're like, "Oh, great." Yeah. We've been trying to ask someone to do that for ages. <laughs> like, so you telling us you just penetration tested our network for free. Great. <laughs> do you have a report? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh. But it was really weird, like, because everything about that company was, like, very similar. Mm. So they just happened to have, like, IP addresses very close to each other and do very similar things because mm. otherwise they would have worked out. It would have been like, oh, this is a mining company mm. and we're testing a tech company. So these... But like everything, even the names are really similar apparently. So anyway, Darknet Diaries, we'll put a link in the show notes. Yes. If you want to listen to a great podcast um, that will probably scare you a bit as well and make you take security a little bit more seriously, um, definitely listen to Darknet Diaries. A long time ago, (laughs) there was a battlefield. Two combatants. (laughs) The historic BMW and the historic Audi. Both were expanding their territories and taking more and more land. They knew a showdown was coming, (laughs) and so they joined battle on the battlefield. And so the historic Audi versus BMW war began. Wait, how do I still know French? Yeah, mate, that was amazing. You just translated that. So, if for those of you who didn't get to see this, Joe just translated French on the fly from a couple of billboards perfectly. Oh, who knows Google? Who needs Google Translate? That's eh? right. Next, next thing we know, Joe will be waving a little white flag here in uh, <laughs> in, uh, in the studio and be singing Frere Jaca. <laughs> so this week in our privacy and security segment, hang on, privacy. <laughs> <laughs> I've just messed <laughs> Sorry. I can't believe I said that before <laughs> You're ashamed that's, of yourself That's a low point <laughs> That's a real low point <laughs> Betrayed my country 